Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. My name is Jonathan, and I'm going to talk about effective debugging today. Uh, and uh, before I get started, I, I, I wanted to explain this awesome flavor saver that I'm rocking right now. Uh, I'm part of Movember, if you've heard of this. It's an organization that's raising awareness about prostate and testicular cancer. If you're interested in, interested in helping out, feel free to uh, come and talk to me after the talk. All right, so today uh, I want to share with you my take on what it takes to be effective in doing uh, debugging in Ruby. Uh, that's going to involve us looking at a case study. We'll look at some basic commands that you can use in almost any library, any library in Ruby that supports debugging. After that, we'll recap what we learned, talk about some advanced commands that may not be available in all the versions of all the libraries. Uh, after that, we'll sort of look at a, a little bit of an overview of the debugging ecosystem so you'll know which version of which library to use with which version of Ruby. And then we'll touch on Pry. If you were in the previous talk in this room, uh, it was an exceptional talk. The guy gave a great, uh, uh, went into great detail about what makes Pry so great. We're not going to do that here, but we will talk about the intersection between uh, Pry and some debugging libraries. So let's get started. Let's look at our case study. So uh, in this case study, we're going to use a gem called Bybug. And uh, here's the situation. We've received a project uh, from a client or a boss. And this project is a simulation of a relationship between a crab and a parasite. And this parasite is called Saculina carcini. Uh, this is a parasitic barnacle. And it, if you look at this picture of the crab and you look at the yellow glistening, disgusting thing on the bottom of it, that's called an externa, and that's where the, the parasite releases its, the larva ch children into the water. Uh, and there's a really interesting aspect. If you haven't investigated, one of my favorite top topics is some biological host parasite relationships. Um, and this is one of the more interesting ones. Uh, I've got a few more. If you want to hear about them, I can share, share the general details with you. But in this case, what this larva does, the Saculina carcini, uh, it, it lands on a crab in the water and it'll crawl along the shell of the crab until it finds some soft part of the exoskeleton. So that's either a joint or an eye socket or an eye stalk. And then what it does is it pierces that uh, soft part of the crab and uh, ejects itself, injects itself into the crab, uh, you know, throwing away its thorax and abdomen. Then it crawls along the inside of the crab. It migrates its way to underneath the heart of the crab and it starts taking nutrients and growing. This takes a couple of weeks of time. Then, this is where it gets really creepy. So this is already, this, this parasite's in there, and, and that's sketchy and scary. That's, you know, you've got another organism living in you. But what gets really weird is that uh, it, it actually starts extending tendrils into the crab's brain, and it starts to change the hormone balance uh, of, a, of a crab. So female crabs, in general, they, you know, they, they reproduce, so they have an egg sac. And when they want to uh, spread their eggs, they climb up to, onto a rocky shelf or rocky outcrop, and they wave their claw in the, air, in, the, in the water to help distribute their eggs. Well, the same behavior is what needs to happen to distribute this parasite. Uh, but this parasite's not picky. It doesn't just infect uh, female crabs. It also infects male crabs. In fact, what it does is it changes the shape of the male crab to be like a female crab. The male crab now acts like a female crab. It performs the same type of behaviors, including crawling up to the top of some, you know, the high part on the bottom of the ocean uh, whether the current is strong and waving its claw to help distribute the larva. So really sketchy stuff, uh, a really interesting relationship, and our software is simulating this relationship. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to look at the code base and, and see if we can add some features to it. So here we are. We've cloned the code base down, and we're going to run RSpec. So this project has a test suite, which is fantastic. It should allow us to move a little bit quicker. And the previous developer that, that gave us this uh, code base says everything is good to go. You can start adding features right away. But uh, trust but verify. We want to make sure that everything's working the way it says it is. We're going to run the test suite. So we do that, and we have a failure. Darn, uh, that stinks. Um, but it's not altogether unexpected, right? Um, sometimes we're, developers are optimistic about how things work. Um, in my experience in developing software, it's very, very tempting for us to ignore the things that we don't understand. And a big, huge, long stack trace when you're getting started in Ruby um, is very intimidating. And people don't want to read it. But it's still intimidating for me, somebody who's been developing Ruby for five or six years. Uh, and so my first point that I'd like to make is to make sure you read the errors that you receive. Uh, read them closely. Uh, it's very easy uh, to, to not be focusing, to not have our attention at 100%. 
uh, because the goal here is that we want to be efficient. And if we're not gi giving our full attention, it's very easy for us to make mistakes that we gl you know, glide over and then find out 10 minutes later that if we'd only paid attention in the very beginning, we would have caught it right away. So uh, we're going to do that right now. We're going to make sure we look closely at that error. And we're going to read that. So the failure error is that the crab's abdomen should have an external. Remember that yellow sack in the image? At some point in this test, that should be present. Uh, we're going to look at the expected value, and uh, this is the part where my eyes, as an experienced Ruby developer, will start to glaze over. There's a class name followed by its location and memory, which is this nice hexadecimal string, uh, and then it has a bunch of instance variables, and I don't want to look at it, but I, I want to make sure that I know what that is. And, and so now I know that that's an instance of Saculina carcini, which uh, is the parasite, and instead of seeing an instance of that class, the parasite, we're seeing a nil value. Um, so the next thing we want to look at, after, we know we, after we're sure we're confident we know what the error is in our test suite, is to examine the stack trace. Now, uh, my tendency, and it, it, when I first started developing, even still now, is to jump into the details and get to the nitty gritty. I would advise against that. Uh, a well-written software will, will segregate out into separate, different layers of abstraction. And at the higher level of abstractions, we can see the broad details of what the application or the program is supposed to do. Um, if it's well-written software, that'll be the case. And we're going to assume that here. I find that that's the best way for us to partition the problem space where the bug can lie. So in a typical software application, you may have tens of thousands of lines of code. If you jump down into the details, there's a lot of details in the application you're going to have to look through to find the bug. So if we can figure out a way to partition that space, and maybe do like a binary search, let's cut it in half and determine that the bug doesn't exist in this half, and we can throw that half away, then we're, we're doing fantastic. We can quickly find the, the, uh, the, the root cause much, uh, much faster and, and resolve it. So for that reason, I advise for you to start at the bottom of the stack trace for the first piece of code that you're responsible for. So that doesn't include libraries. Uh, you don't want to dig into library code unless you're sure there's an error there. And 99 999,999 no, 9 times out of 10,000, it's always your code, right? It's never the other person's code. So in general, find the code that you own and start there. That should be the highest level of abstraction. We want to make sure that things are good there, and we understand the context as we dive into those layers. So in this case, the error is on line 12 of a feature file. Now, we are using a, a tool called Turnip. This, app, this uh, program is using Turnip, which is uh, a, a a, uh, gives us Gherkin syntax. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's, it's also used in Cucumber, which gives us a nice high-level overview. Uh, the features are written in plain English. The implementi implementation details are abstracted away. And that's what we have here. And then the key point to take away from, from Turnip, if you're not familiar with it, is that we have a series of steps. They're executed in sequential order. If any step has, contains an expectation that fails, execution will stop on that step, and that will be where the error is reported and the stack trace is shared with us, like the one we just saw. The one we just saw. So line 12 is the line we're interested in, and if we look at line 12, it's just telling us the same thing that was in the error. We don't have any more information. Uh, it's not telling us exactly what's going. So it's, the other thing I like to, to point out is that it's, it's important to go back to my error. It's important for me to maintain a, uh, a, a good understanding of what my, what problem I'm trying to solve. If I get lost in between the trees, I can forget what problem was I trying to solve. So let's go back and look at our stack trace again. We're actually interested in the next level up. And in that case, that is spec steps.rb on line 32. So let's examine that step definition file and see if we can learn a little bit more. So here we are. I've opened up the spec steps.rb file. And we are interested in line 32. Um, if we take a second to read this line, we can see that we have an instance variable of a crab. There's some method called payload that's being called on it, and we're, we're there, we are uh, indexing into that uh, via infection, and we expect whatever the value of that is to equal a, an instance variable that says Cyclina carcini. So if we think about our error, we can say that, that there's an instance of a Cyclina carcini, and we expect it to be there, but we're seeing nil instead. So if we uh, take a step back and look at our feature again, we know the failure is on line 12, then we have a really good idea of where the error is probably occurring. It's somewhere between lines 3 through 11, uh, right? A simple process of elimination. That's our, that's our search space. This is the prob where the problem could reside. We need to figure out where in between lines 3 and 11 this, the error is actually occurring, determine the root cause, 
and resolve it. So again, at this, it's always tempting to jump down into the details uh, of the, the crab and try to figure out what's going on. In this example uh, that I've, I'm sharing with you, it's very, it's going to be a simple example. We could get away with that. We can do that in small applications. But in larger applications that maybe have years of development, uh, years of different approaches to solving problems uh, with different styles in the same code base, uh, maybe good code coverage in some sections of the application and not in the others, that can lead you down rabbit holes that take, uh, that can distract you from actually getting your problem solved. So I say let's not do that. Let's keep things very simple. Uh, let's try to stay assumption free if we can. So we're going to use the Bybug gem. It's hosted on Ruby gems, and there's two things that we have to do to use Bybug. Number one, we're going to add it to our gem file, um, run uh, Bundler, and then number two, we need to make a method call. So we're looking at our step file here, and we're going to add a method call in here. Um, and but where should we put it? Uh, remember, we have those steps, when we were looking at our feature file, we saw lines three through 11. We're looking at the actual step definitions now. Well, here's the first two, two features. There is a crab and there is a Saculina carcini. So there is a host and there is a parasite. From looking at lines two and line six, we can quickly see that there's not any relationship between those two instance variables. So this is probably not where our problem is going to lie. We can sort of say, make a good safe assumption that the background steps, they're fine. If there was even more going on in there, we might have to dig into there a little further, but we're good. Uh, so we're going to drop it into the very first step that's not a background step that was uh, occurring on line 8 in the feature file, which in this case we're going to drop it in line 10. So we're dropping the debugger method call on line 10. Uh, the important thing to note about using a debugger, if you haven't used one in the past, is that when execution reaches the debugger statement, and the debugger method call, the execution of our application is going to stop and will be dropped into the debugger session. So let's see that happening. We're going to run our focused feature. And here we are. You can see that we ran bundle. And then we run our focus feature. And when we do that, we are paused. Uh, so let's take a moment and dissect what we see. If you've not used the debugger, and uh, most people, my familiarity when I started using a debugger was GDB. That's my background. When I came to Ruby, I struggled with the fact that there wasn't great debugging support um, out of the gate. Um, but if you're, if, if you're a person who's been using IDEs in the past, it may be a little confusing, so we're going to break this down real quick. Here's the context. We can see 10 lines of context, and uh, we can see the line numbers that where we're at in the left-hand column. We can see where the execution is paused. We're paused on the line 11. There's a nice little hash rocket there that shows us that to keep us uh, uh, knowing where we're at. Um, so let's examine the code in this step. So there's two lines. And uh, I don't know what's going on in line 11. I don't need to know. But I can tell from the error message that we received that line 12 looks really interesting. Uh, the crab's payload was nil when the test expected there to be a value. Um, so we're at the, we are at the, uh, we want to make sure that we can see how that value changes throughout the execution of our application. So there's a nice feature in the debugger called display. This is a watched variable or display variable. We're going to write out display and then an arbitrary Ruby expression. And we're going to hit enter. Once we do that, note that now in our uh, debugger session, as part of that, we have uh, something that is going to display the expression on every debugger command that we provide to it. So we will, can, every step that we take through the application, every time execution is paused, we can verify has something changed with that particular Ruby expression. All right, so we're going to move forward. Uh, we've got that set now. So we're going to use the step command. This is the next command. If you're not familiar with this, this is going to execute uh, uh, one Ruby command and move us forward. So we're going to enter, hit step and hit enter. And the first thing to note is to double check. Has anything changed with our display Ruby expression? And nothing has. It still, it still points to nothing. But something else has changed. You may have noticed that the context for where we're at has changed. And so we're no longer in the step definition file. Now we are in another file, which is cut off a little bit on my slide, but it's the, it's the parasites attach method. And we can see uh, that's not where we want to be. So we've just dropped down one level of abstraction a little bit deeper than I think we need to be. We want to stay at the same level until we've determined that we need to dive deeper. Uh, this will keep us from falling down rabbit holes and spending time doing things that are not going to lead us to resolving the issue. Sometimes you get lucky if you try that, but uh, it's, if we're playing a percentages game, it's not the way to go. So uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to type in step three. All right, so I can pass an arbitrary argument, uh, integer argument, excuse me. I can pass an integer argument 
two step that'll tell it how many times to run. Uh, how do I know that it, I should run it three times? Well, I can see here that there's three lines, but it's because I wrote this and I already know that. So we're gonna use that for now just to, just to move along. Um, so we're gonna step three and that's gonna take us back up to the level of abstraction that we were operating at before. So now we're, we're paused before the execution of line 12. And we are back in our steps file and double checking that our displayed variable hasn't changed. So even though I sort of cheated and I skipped through the attach method, nothing changed in our displayed Ruby expression. So we're good. I cheated a little bit, but that way I just cut out at that method. If that method was seven, uh, seven uh, method calls and maybe hitting an external service and nothing changed, then I didn't have to go examine those things. So that's a win. So we're gonna step forward again and Voila, something has changed. Our, display, our displayed Ruby expression, which is the crab's payload infection, has a value. This is fantastic. But our context has changed again, and this can be a little jarring when you're first using the debugger. We're now on the turnip rspec.rb file, so now we have actually moved into the uh, internal turnip library, and this is not where we want to be at all. We're not even in our application anymore. So we, uh, we're interested in what happens at the turnip step levels of eight, nine, 10, and 11, right? We're not concerned about background. And so how can we quickly stop execution in each of those lines? Well, there's one way that I've already shared with you uh, that we could use. Uh, we could add debugger statements to line 16, 20, 24, and 28. So we have it on line 10 that would look something like this. We'd have debugger statements. Now we're littering our code, but that's, there's a much better way. And we can make use of another command called break, which adds a breakpoint, which is a place that the execution of the application should stop. Uh, I'm using an abbreviated version of the break command. It's normally you use break spelled out B-R-E-A-K. And instead I'm just using the shorthand version. I'm gonna create a break statement on line 16 of steps.rb. So I'm gonna do the same thing again on line 20, again on line 24, again on line 28. And now we've got all our breakpoints set at each of the step definitions. And now I'm gonna use a new command called continue which says continue execution of the application until the program completes or I hit another breakpoint. So we continue, we hit enter, and now we can see that we have, a break, we're at breakpoint number one, uh, our crab's payload has stayed the same, uh, and we are on line 16, all right? So fantastic, uh, nothing has changed. You can't quite see the memory location of this instance of Sacculina Carcini, that's fine. Uh, trust me, it's good, uh, it hasn't changed. Um, so we're gonna continue. Again, we're partitioning the search space. We're not concerned, we're looking to see where does this value change for the first time. So we hit continue again, and now we hit breakpoint number two. We examine our displayed va uh, variable, it's good. We hit continue again, uh, now I'm using the abbreviated version of continue, uh, which is just the character C. And we hit breakpoint number three, again our displayed uh, arbitrary Ruby expression, in this case the crab's payload is still the same. And then we hit continue again, and now we are at breakpoint number four. Still, nothing's changed in our displayed variable. This is uh, interesting, right? We would expect, we've really just cut out about 75% of the search space where the, where the error could reside. So we're looking at this line. The crabs, does, uh, at crab, does it have an external, this, this, this uh, method call external question mark. The last time we stepped into a method, we took a detour that wasn't necessary or informative. So let's look at another command that we can use. We're gonna look at the command called next. And the next command, what it does is it will execute the next line of code, and uh, if, that's a, if it's a method, it will wait till that method returns before uh, pausing execution again. So this, if this method contains uh, a lot of things that are going on, it can take a little bit of time, but once you hit, type in next and hit enter, you'll move to the next line. So in this case, is line 29. And there's something interesting about this line. If you were in the pry talk, you might have, you might have expected this. Uh, there, there's, the, we, the, we, there's nothing else that could be wrong, but if we look back to our display variable and start comparing, now that we have, con we have the context between what we expect to see and what the test is expecting in the same place, we can see that we have a very common error. Uh, the string versus symbol. If you're a Rails developer, uh, I would say that Rails facilitates us making this mistake because it uses hash with a different axis, which makes us think that strings and symbols that represent the same thing are, are the same thing, but they're not. This, since this is a regular Ruby program, this is probably the source of the bug and the code, and it's an easy one to make. So we're gonna quit out of our uh, debugger session and test this out. Uh, and then for some reason, all the debuggers like to make sure you're really sure and confident that you're ready to quit. Um, 
So let's go dive into our steps file. Uh, we're going to make the change. We have a string for infection. We're going to change it to symbol. And then we're going to remove our debugger statement. Uh, we've got our steps file. We save that. And now we can run our test suite. And success, we've got a green test suite. Now we can move forward with confidence in developing our feature set or, or, or doing whatever is needed. So to recap, uh, we covered six commands. We talked about debugger. We talked about display. We talked about step, break, and continue, and next. Um, the debugger method pauses the execution, but actually, I sort of just lied to you guys a little bit. We remember we're using the bybug gem. Uh, bybug doesn't support the method debugger. It actually requires that you use bybug if you're using 2.3.1, which is the latest version. Uh, so anywhere we saw the word debugger used, which was actually only in one location, you would have to use bybug. Um, however, that should change. Uh, just recently, I, I submitted a pull request to the maintainer of bybug, and that's been accepted. So the next version that gets pushed out to RubyGems, you can use the debugger alias. So to recap display, to go into a little more detail, uh, you can pass in an arbitrary Ruby expression. You can abbreviate it as DISP. The step command takes an arbitrary integer argument that tells how many times it needs to be done. The break command, the way we saw it used, you pass in a file name followed by a colon, followed by a line number. Uh, you can use the abbreviated version. And then there's actually a couple other ways. One, you can drop in uh, a break statement for the method, for a class method by using class.class .class method. You can also do the same thing for an instance method. And then we looked at the continue command. We looked at the next where you can also, we didn't see this, but you can pass in an integer as an optional argument to next. And you can also abbreviate next as in. So let's look at a couple of advanced commands. Those commands that we just looked at, you could use that in any version of the libraries that I'm going to talk about today, which are the majority of the debugging libraries. Um, but we missed a couple of things that are advanced, that are available in Bybug, that are highly useful. Uh, and those are finish, save, and source. So let's look at finish real quick and see how that would work. The finish, uh, remember in our case study uh, a couple minutes ago when we were looking on line 11 and we stepped into the attach method and that was not the thing that we wanted to do. And so then I used step three to jump back out of it and I just happened to know that if I stepped three times we'd, we would pop that frame off the stack. Uh, we could have used the finish command there instead. That would have runs execution until a stack frame is popped off and then repause execution of the application. Uh, and so we come back out to line 12. Super simple, doesn't work in some of the libraries that we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes. Save, this one is, super, this one is key. Uh, in simple applications, uh, you probably won't need this, but in more complex applications that have external dependencies on third-party APIs or on the database, uh, you may establish, uh, you may be trying to partition your search space of the problem domain to figure out where the bug is lying or where the root cause of the bug is lying, and you may have to exit out of your debugger session and reset that state if you're debugging something in your development environment or even worse, if you were develop, uh, debugging something in your production environment. So the save command allows us to save this, the state of the debugger session. So if we were to in, input arbitrary some displayed uh, expressions along with some break statements, and we needed to change, we need to exit out of the application and change some external state to see if we can trigger the bug again, we can use the save command. It takes a optional argument that is a file name. Uh, if you don't, it'll drop it somewhere in temp. Uh, and then once you hit enter there, it actually saves it out to that file name. I like to use something like debug.commands. It's pretty obvious what that is. And then if we go look at the debug.commands file, we'll see that uh, the statements, the lines that we just entered are there. We, our break statements are there. Our displayed value is there, as well as some more things. So let's, let's take a second to talk about what those are. Uh, auto eval means that if I type something, uh, an arbitrary expression into my prompt in a debugger session that it will automatically evaluate it. That's on by default in Bybug. Uh, base name is off, so right now we're seeing the full path for all files in the output. Um, you can turn that off if you don't need that. I left it on here um, because that's the default. Um, testing, I'm not actually sure what that does, uh, but uh, it seems to be off, so I guess that's a good thing. Uh, auto list is the thing that's giving us the context. That's a default of Bybug. And then auto IRB is off. So if you like to use uh, features of IRB, you can turn that on so that instead of landing into a debugger prompt, you're landed into you dropped into an IRB prompt. And the way that works is it'll try to execute 
uh, whatever you type in as a debugger command first, and if that fails, then it'll execute it in the context of IRB. So pretty cool. So that's the save command. You can think about the save command as serializing the state of your debugger session out to a file. Alternatively, you have source, which does what you would think. This is deserializing the state of a debugger session. This is when we've restarted and we don't want to have to re-enter all our breakpoints. Um, one of the things that I haven't talked about in this talk is that you can pass conditionals into your uh, break commands as to maybe if you want to only call the hit the breakpoint on another arbitrary Ruby expression. Uh, remember, we're trying to partition our search space, so if you have a huge loop that's looping over things of thousands of times or a bunch of data that you're not interested in, you might not need to wait until the 999th iteration of your loop, maybe if you know there's a thousand objects in there. You don't want to hit that breakpoint 999 times, so you can pass an arbitrary expression to handle that. Um, so we use the source command, we hit enter, fantastic, we see that our breakpoints are automatically created for us nice and quick, that the display variable is there, and that the other uh, session, uh, session variables for the debugger are reestablished. So, fantastic. You're ready to run out and go use the debugger, right? You're super excited. I can tell you guys are ready to walk right out. Uh, hold up a second. Let's talk about which version of Ruby was I using, because that matters. This whole, the, con the implicit context in this talk has been that we're using CRuby. We're using MRI. And in fact, we've been using uh, Ruby 2.0 patch 247. Unfortunately, it wasn't always so great. Uh, Here's your, your, your cheat sheet as to which libraries you, you can use with which versions of Ruby. If you're on 1.8, you have to use something called ruby-debug. If you're on Ruby 1.9, you have a few options. Uh, none of them are super great. You have debugger, you have ruby-debug 1.9, you have debugger 2. Uh, if you've tried to use these in the past, you may have found issues getting uh, some C extensions to compile that they depend upon. Um, and if you're using Ruby 2.0, you still have a few options. Debugger's available, Debugger 2 is available. Bybug is the one I recommend. Um, both Debugger and Debugger 2 are, they don't have full support for everything that they, that's documented. So why is this the case? So it's because debuggers stink, especially in Ruby. Okay, that's my provocative slide. I'm just trying to say something, uh, some, something that we can argue about later. Um, but let's talk about why that's the case. Previous to Ruby 2.0, all of the debuggers would hook into internals to the C API. So anytime you had a new version of Ruby release, anytime a new patch level came out, your debugger broke and you couldn't use the debugger. So if you were the type of person, as I was, who likes using the debugger to quickly uh, rectify the cognitive dissonance between the, my understanding of the code and how it actually works, there would be times where you wouldn't have a debugger available for your version of Ruby for a week, two weeks, and to, to however long it took for the maintainer to to bump their dependency. And what we're looking at here is the debugger uh, uh, change log on GitHub. And the majority of point releases were to match up with point uh, patch levels that have been released for Ruby. So again, the earlier in Ruby 1.8 and 1.9, the C API was tightly coupled uh, to, the debuggers were tightly coupled to the Ruby C API. This was a problem. Uh, that's not the case anymore in Ruby 2.0. Uh, they've, uh, uh, they wrote, uh, the Ruby core maintainers wrote something called TracePoint API, which is what gems can hook into to get in, uh, to look into the internals of Ruby. That's fantastic because now there's a well-defined interface and when the internals of the Ruby C API change, the, we, they, we have a contract that we know is not going to change. So uh, if you're going to use, if you need a debug in Ruby 1.8, I saw on Heroku's blog post, uh, I think it was within the last year that there's still people who are using Ruby 1.8. There might have been even one that was still using 1.8.6. Um, but I'm pretty sure it's still 1.8.7, so if you're using 1.8, you're gonna use ruby-debug. Uh, in that case, if you want the functionality that we looked at here, you need to set a few variables in a rdebug rc file, a dot rdebug rc file. So you wanna set your auto reload, your auto eval, and your auto list. If you're using bybug and you wanna change those default values, it's actually bybug rc as opposed to rdebug rc. Uh, if you're using 1.9, you have options. Good luck. I don't know which one will compile for you in your situation, um, uh, but those are your options. Uh, debugger, debugger 2, Ruby dash, debug 1.9. And then if you're going to use 2, just use bybug. Uh, debugger and debugger 2, they're not fully fleshed out. Uh, the, the person who's maintaining debugger is not actively working in Ruby anymore. So there is an option if you want to, there's an open source repository that needs some help. You could jump in, garbage collect there. There's a good amount of work that has been done. In fact, that's why Bybug was created. The developer, he was frustrated with some problems he was having with debugger. 
And so he, he created Bybug to, to resolve that. So I said I was going to talk about Pry. Um, one of my many, uh, many, uh, my many pet peeves, is this tiny one here, is that a lot of people say, oh, I just use Pry to debug things. Well, Pry isn't a debugger. If you were in the last talk, uh, uh, it was made clear that Pry is an alternative to IRB. Um, what's really cool about it is the, the, the plugin architecture has allowed a lot of people to build really cool tools on top of Pry. It's got syntax highlighting built in, which is really cool. So I'm going to take a second to show us real quick what that would look like if we did our case study with Pry. So instead of just having Bybug, we would have uh, pry dash bybug. So this would say that we have pry available uh, within our bybug sessions. And instead of using the debugger uh, method call, which remember we can't use until the next version of bybug is released, uh, we would use binding.pry. So we run our feature, and uh, execution is paused on that line. This is very similar to what we were seeing before. The, only, the main thing to note that's different is you got pretty colors. Fantastic. Um, you have commands like step. It's very similar. We saw that earlier. We have next. We're going to next over that attach method. Uh, but one of the key differences to note, if you're going to use, if you're a pry lover and you want to use uh, debugging functionality with pry, is that you don't have the alias uh, for B by default. You have to type out break, um, and you have you uh, you have to type out the relative path of the file to where your application is running. So we have to write out specs forward slash steps.rb. We can't just say steps.rb and give it a line number. Um, other than that, as soon as the other th interesting thing that Pry does, as soon as I hit enter on this line, it actually takes us, it creates the breakpoint for us and takes us and shows us the context of that breakpoint. So we haven't actually moved, we haven't actually executed anything other than creating a breakpoint in our debugger session, but now we're seeing the context of that. That's a little different than we saw before, right? So we're on, now we see where our breakpoint is. This is this is nice in case you're like, ooh, I put the breakpoint in the wrong spot. Maybe you can delete the, the breakpoint or disable it. So once we actually hit continue, then we see that we've actually hit the breakpoint. And a nice thing that the pry is giving us is showing us how many times we hit that breakpoint. Um, if you do want the aliases, there is a way to do that in pry. You can alias commands. You can drop that in a dot pry rc. Um, so that's fantastic. Uh, if you want to use pry with debugger, uh, you can use pry dash debugger. That'll give you the debugger that has all the problems that we talked about along with pry in Ruby 1.9, uh, and you can use it with pry dash bybug. So uh, real quick, a, a couple more things about bybug. Uh, it was a mashup of something called dbase. dbase is what's being used in RubyMine. Uh, and so they, uh, he, the developer, uh, David, took the C extension portion of dbase and combined it with the lib and the test deers of debugger and put that together, put in a lot of work to fix any of the open issues that were uh, existing on debugger. And so that's why you need to use bybug, because it actually works and does all the things it says it's going to use and, and do. Um, it works on Ruby 2, doesn't work on 1.9, doesn't have any internal source code dependencies. Um, it's fantastic. All right, so that covers CRuby, right? Now you have a good idea of which debuggers to use with which version of Ruby you need to use it for. You know the basics of how to do it, and hopefully if the version you're using uh, supports the advanced commands, you know how to do that as well. What about Rubinius? Great news. Rubinius has a debugger built in. If you've never used Rubinius, this is fantastic. You don't have to include a separate library. It has all of the functionality that we just talked about, plus a little bit more. Um, that's awesome. What about JRuby? If you're using JRuby and you, need to do, and you, and you want to debug things, um, you've got the whole Java ecosystem to lean on. There's a tool called Visual VM. Uh, I've used it in the past when I needed to do memory debugging in Ruby. Uh, and so there's uh, the tooling uh, uh, system in Java is much more mature than it is in Ruby. Um, for, and so that's fantastic. So you have those are your choices there. So to recap, we, uh, we looked at a case study. We looked at the basic commands of next, step, break, continue, and display. Uh, we looked at some advanced commands that are not available everywhere, but they're available in Bybug. That's finish, source, and save. Uh, if you're using Ruby 187, you're going to use Ruby dash debug. If you're using 1.9, you're going to use debugger. And if you're using 2.0, you're going to use Bybug. Um, if you're going to use pry, you can. You can use them with both of them. And in fact, in the last talk, they talked about using pry dash plus. I would highly recommend that as well. Uh, my slides are available up on speaker deck. Um, I'll tweet those out later, too. Uh, you can see the source code repository for what we used in this project, uh, attributions for the nasty photo of the, the, the host crab with its uh, Saculina carcini parasite, and that's the credit there. 
I've got a nice stash for a reason. You can talk to me about it. If you want to get to know me, you can go check out my blog. If you want to follow me on Twitter, if you want to work with me, I work at a company called Big Nerd Ranch. Uh, we develop iOS, Android apps. Uh, we also do the backends for those things in Ruby. Um, and I thank them for giving me the time to work on this type of stuff and, and uh, come and work on these types of presentations to share with you guys. Thanks to the organizers. And if you want to code with me and don't want to work with me, you can come code with me on GitHub. So that's it. I'm open up to questions if anybody has any. Thank you so much.